Hi everyone, today we're going to have a look at how to create your form for phase two so that you can create your questionnaire. I'm going to be using Google Forms as an example, but you're more than welcome to use Microsoft Forms or SurveyMonkey or something similar. What you need to do this is you need to have a free Google account or you can use your school's Google for Education account. Log into your Gmail, go to the apps launcher at the top right or click on the, it's the waffle icon as well that some people call it and just go to Drive. Once you're in Drive, you can click on New and Google Forms and then it'll just open a blank form for you. Now you can enter a heading that matches basically what you're planning on doing and what your topic is. I'm just going to create a simple topic for this example. Once you've put in your heading, you can actually click at the top left where it says Untitled Form and you'll see that it inherits the same heading at the top. This file will now be available in your Google Drive. If you go down, you'll see it's actually put the new name there. So if you need to change anything or if you need to go back to your form, this is where you'll find it. It's just open drive again. That's where you can open the form again. Next up, you need to insert a form description. The best would be to insert something about the purpose of the form, who you are and what this is for. So like that it's for your cat subject, what the purpose is, what this research is for. And while you're typing, if you want to insert and enter, you can just press shift enter and then you can type in the next line. Now that we've got our intro ready, we can have a look at the settings for the form. So we don't need to change too much. Um, just so that you know what's happening here, our responses, we're not going to collect email addresses or anything. We don't want to have people editing their responses. Presentation over here. Um, we don't, un unless you have like lots of sections, it's not necessary to show a progress bar, but the confirmation message is important. I, it's best to actually personalize that, edit it and say thank you so much for filling in this form or something like that, just actually showing that you appreciate their time. Okay, we definitely don't want them to fill in the same form twice, so we're going to take off this show link to submit another response. Now, the form defaults we don't have to worry about, but the question defaults, it helps a lot to make questions required by default so that you don't have to go switch on required for every single question because people tend to forget to do that. Now let's go to questions. The first thing you need to do is you need to add a title and description. So you'll see when you add your title and description, because I first clicked on the question, it adds it underneath the question. So if I want to move things around, I can just drag it with my four way arrow on this little handle in the middle. So your first heading needs to be something like something about the content that it's going to contain hey probably something about about you or the personal questions or biographical data or something like that hey so i'm going to make it about you and if you want you can put a description um maybe you can say that this section is optional because remember because of the poppy act we're not really supposed to be collecting any personal information um especially not something that can be connected back to a specific person um so you could perhaps say this whole section is uh, optional. That's up to you. Okay. Once you've added a question or two, you'll probably need to add another title or description. And you can decide if you want to add it as another title and description or whether you want to add another section. So the difference between these two are that a title and description just shows it on this page as a title and a section actually adds a new page that also then has a new title. Let's have a look at how we can change what our form looks like. We can customize the theme over here, choose a different color, color scheme, even a font, although I must say the fonts don't really look very great. Um, once you've changed it, it doesn't change the options fonts. So I, 
I don't really like changing the font. I leave it on basic, but it's completely up to you. And consider if you do choose a different header, this might be a little bit more data intensive, so I'm not sure if that's always wise. If you do, it has to be very closely related to the topic, please. Now, if you want to see what your questionnaire looks like so far, you can go click on this little preview button over here and it'll show you what everything looks like so far. Now let's look at the question types. You'll see I used this button to add a question, the plus, but there are lots of different question types. So let's see what they actually look like. On the right here, I've got an example form, which I'll link for you in the description below, so that you can play around with it yourself. It's a great form to show you the different question types and forms and guide you through some of the basics of how it works. So you'll see it is actually published under Creative Commons license, so I am allowed to actually share it with you. So let's see how this works. The basic question types, there are 11 question types, so they collect data in different ways. So this is what a title and description block looks like. You'll see they actually put in a header image. And this first one over here, your first name, is a short answer question. So if we had to create the same thing, I would put it in like this. And to put, a, you'll see it's actually automatically, it's so clever, it actually automatically guessed that it's a short answer type. And this whole sentence underneath is actually um, entered in the description. So if you want to add a description, you can click on the three dots over here and you click and you type there and then you'll put in the description over there. And they tell us here that it can be validated to accept only certain kinds of responses. And then they give you an example here, one that can actually only accept a valid website address, one that won't um, accept negative numbers. So you can try that as well. You can click on the three dots over here and you'll see there's a response validation option. So basically how this works is it works the same as validation rules and text in um, Access, although the format and how you actually do it does not work the same. But for example, if you actually wanted people to enter a number over here, you can make sure that they are only allowed to enter a number. Or if it has to be text, you can do that. Um, if it has to be a certain length, you can do that as well. So for a number, you can say it has to be less than or equal to, let's say, 24 hours in a day, something like that. Um, and then you can put in a custom error message if people put in a wrong number, for example. If you want to delete this validation rule, you can just click on the cross over here and then it'll just be a regular short answer text. The next type we're looking at is a paragraph question. So this is the paragraph option. I don't think you'll be using that because a long answer text paragraph is actually only used. Do you see it says um, you oh, okay. it's, it has virtually no length limit, but you can actually um, enforce a minimum character count. But this won't really work because you would have to read through each person's answer and manually actually extract information. And the purpose of phase two is ex to extract the information in a spreadsheet or in a database. So this won't work for our example. The next one we're going to look at is a multiple choice. So a multiple choice, as you can see, uses radio buttons. It, you use this to give various options. You type in the different options but you can only choose one. So people are only allowed to choose one. And if you are, if you think there's a possibility that you can't think of all of the options, you can even add this one that says add other so that people can type in their own option, just so that you can see what this would look like. You'll see it looks like this. Then people can type in their own option. Please only use that if you're really sure you can't think of all the options. The next one that you really need to use with a lot of care is a checkbox question. Checkboxes allow you, like they said here, it can allow you to choose more than one option. So by default, it has unlimited number of um, options, but you need to actually tell people in the description how many they are allowed to choose. So something like choose all that apply or choose only two, um, but don't write it in the question like they did over here. P 
please write it in the description. The next one is a drop down list. So a drop down looks like this. And like they say here, it's more suited when there is a longer list of choices. But here people can only choose for a single option. But it works well when there's a longer list. One also gets a file upload that obviously has lots of security problems. And I don't think for our pet we would possibly use a file upload option. The next one that we really need to discuss properly is a linear scale question. This is a fantastic question. I think everybody's pet has to have a linear scale option. Let's see, I'm going to make my question, do you like pets? Okay, so I'm going to say no and yes. So you'll see I didn't include the instruction of one means no and five means yes in my question and I didn't include that in my description either because you actually use these little rows underneath the numbers to indicate this. Do you see this? It actually puts a little word next to the numbers. So if we go and preview this, this is what it ends up as. Okay. Now you'll see if you use a long list of, num of numbers like 1 to 10, please excuse the noise, it's my lovely pet, my cat right next to me. Um, so if you use a long list of numbers like 1 to 10, it's actually too many numbers for a cell phone to display. So if, you, if you're sending this to people who will probably fill it in on a mobile phone, then 10 is probably a scale that's too large. Um, I'd say five or six is probably the max that you should go. And you can't put in a very long description for that same reason. It doesn't work well on a mobile phone. You can't put a whole sentence here on a description like, no, I don't really think so. Something like that's not going to work. The other tip I want to give you is if you have an even number of options, people have to choose if they are more inclined to, to towards the one or more inclined towards the other because there's not a middle option. They have to choose are they more inclined towards very much or more inclined towards not at all. Whereas if you only give them an uneven number of choices, they always have the option to choose the one in the middle, which actually means I don't know. Okay, so that's not a very good way to set questions. So if you want a good answer, it's better to actually use an even number. So either make this six or make this zero or use it one to four. That also works well. Okay, then you get two more types, a multiple choice grid like they showed over here. Um, it works well for more statements about how people feel about things. Um, also, just for like questions, like here's a multiple choice matching a country with a capital. Um, just to take note that this will create lots of data. So if you do need more questions and you're planning on using this for your spreadsheet and for your database, then this might work very well. The descriptions, these longer ones can be in the rows and the shorter ones need to be in the columns. And you'll see you need to decide here whether you require a response in each row or not. You also get a multiple choice grid, a checkbox grid, so that people can actually choose more than one, you see, in a column or in a row, so that there isn't a specific limit. Okay. Then the last two, that's quite self-explanatory, is a date and time. So for a date, you'll see the month, day, year order is actually completely up to the regional settings of your computer. So if I actually click to type in there, mine will show in this order because this is the regional settings for my computer, but it might not necessarily show for everybody else. So I would recommend that you actually use this format for collecting people's dates of birth rather than asking people's ages, since you can then work out their age yourself and actually get marks for those calculations then. If you want to go and play around with this some more, please follow the link in the description below and then you can see how this works. Right, now that I've got my questionnaire completed, I can preview it, make sure that everything looks right. I can perhaps fill it in once myself to check that it works the way I want it to work. And then when I'm ready to send it, I can click on 
this send button or if your screen is bigger it's probably going to look like that send and then you can firstly if your teacher asks you to you can add them as a collaborator so that they can check your questions this might be good if there's any chance that you might um, forget your password to a new account if you just created your account now then you can add collaborators over here Otherwise, if you just want to send this to someone to fill in, you'll put their email addresses here in the to field. But you'll probably use this link to send it to people. So you can share it here by, via Facebook or Twitter, but you'll probably be sending this link to people. So you can shorten it over here. And then one of the easiest things you can do is either email this to yourself um, open up WhatsApp web on the computer and copy and paste it. But if that is not possible, you can also go and shorten this link on a site like Bitly. So if we go and try that quickly, I can go to bit.ly. That's the site's name. And then if you haven't got an account, you can log in uh, or sign up for free. That's quite good because then you can change the link's name um, and then you actually have a history of it. But otherwise, you can shorten your link here without signing up. Click on shorten. Sometimes it doesn't work with one of the two, either the long one or the shorter one. So just check if it doesn't work, try the other one. And now you'll see here it's given me one. I can click on copy or I can just retype it and I can make sure that I can just type it in my own messages and I can then send it on to people. If this is difficult to read and there's like a an I or an O and you're not sure whether it's an L or a capital I, then you can just copy this and paste it in Word and then change the font to something that you can read more easily. As people fill in your form, you'll see that the different responses show up here. So whenever you open your form, you'll see your questions on the first tab, your responses on the second tab, and it shows you how many responses there are. If somebody filled in a nonsense response, you can go and click on individual, you can page through them, and you can delete a specific response. It warns you that it can't be undone, and you can decide whether you want to do that or not. When you're done, you'll switch off your form so that people don't waste their time filling in a form that's actually not active anymore. You can then print the individual responses and save it as a PDF so that you have proof of the people who filled in your form. And lastly, what you'll do is you'll actually create a spreadsheet which you'll then download to use in Microsoft Excel.